this is a case of there's a lot of water under the bridge. So when I say that this is a leadership imperative, really trying to create a healthy work environment that addresses the conventional pillars of a healthy work environment, but also disruptive behavior. What I'm really saying is, is that 85% who shows up every day, ready, willing, and able to do their very best, they're watching you as the leader. And they're wondering, what about this behavior do you not see, recognize, want to deal with? You know, are you condoning low performance? Are you condoning uncivil behavior? You know, uh, remember, those kinds of bad attitudes are contagious. So you could really damage the entire culture of your department yeah. by just letting this person arbitrarily run around like a chicken, you know, without a head. And then try to hold all of your top performers up to a different standard. It's not going to work. You're going to bleed talent doing it. This week's show, uh, this week's show is really a flashback show for me in so many ways. We're going to talk about creating a healthy workplace environment. But more specifically, what my guest Phil Quinlan is going to really dive into is two kinds of disruptive behavior. I mean, we're talking about really disruptive behavior, one of them being more narcissistic bullying behavior and how folks that are um, not the healthiest, how they can really not only disrupt but manipulate our work environments. And she's got some fantastic tips for how to deal with those folks. So what I want you to pay attention to um, is when she lists out the two kinds of folks that she's got for us, I want you to listen really close to how she not only gives us signs that we can identify them, but the steps we need to take to resolve those behaviors. She gives some great ones, and you can tell she's been doing this a really long time. So listen really, really close, because it is gonna really help you deal with some of the more tricky um, personalities in our workplace. The Workplace Therapist Show is sponsored by the Leadership Foundry, bringing a cutting edge real world approach to leadership development. The Leadership Foundry partners with each client organization to create a custom tailored experience, virtual or in person, that combines innovative leadership content, world class facilitators and one on one coaching to ensure your leaders have everything they need to grow and thrive. To find out more and to design your one of a kind program, visit my leadership foundry com. Phyllis, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm really excited about our conversation today. I'm really excited about just this general topic of making sure we're creating healthy work environment and we're trying to either prevent or eliminate some of those disruptive behaviors that get in the way. Um, so I'm not only looking forward to your perspective on what makes a healthy work environment, also how we can prevent some of those other behaviors. Uh, but before I go too much further, I want to make sure I properly introduce you. So you're Phyllis Quinlan. You are the president and CEO of MFW Consultants to Professionals. You're also the author of Bring Shadow Behavior in the Light of Day, Understanding and Effectively Managing Bullying and Incivility in Healthcare. Really awesome to have you on the show, Phyllis. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, thank you so much. It's, it's an honor to be here. Yeah. So maybe a, a good starting place. Uh, tell us a little bit more about you. How did you um, get doing this and what's been kind of your, your uh, career background up to this point? So I am a nurse. I've been a nurse for 43 years, um, and I've practiced in a variety of you know settings. So clinical, education, administrative, um, and and really, you know, I, I had an opportunity to open up MFW Consultants, my 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 consulting firm, back in 1994. Mm. And a few years into that, I started adding the coaching piece of the services to my consulting firm. I think when you're in education, people feel very comfortable speaking to you. You're not administration, so you're not crime and punishment, so they speak to you more readily. And it was a natural flow. Um, and, you know, starting to listen to some of the concerns that my coaching clients were bringing up, about, I'm going to say about 15 years ago, I really started to hear um, a little bit, about, a lot of it, about um, concerns about caregiver fatigue. Um, or what we might call burnout, yeah. uh, and also, you know, trying to work in an unhealthy work environment where people were being targeted by bullies. Now, I've been a professional coach for over 20 years. I, I am certified by the International Coaching Federation, and, you know, I really saw this as something I really needed to do a lot more work in because I certainly have been bullied in the workplace myself. 
Mm. Um, and, and what I see now is that this is such a leadership imperative. Creating a healthy work environment um, is just a fundamental leadership imperative to being able to create an environment where your staff can thrive. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I've got so many questions around this for you because I'm passionate about this topic as well. So let, let's start first about you know, creating that healthy work environment. So when you think about a healthy work environment, what are some of those pillars or ideas that kind of make that up? So, you know, there are various, um, you know, organizations that will put out what they think a healthy work environment should be. You know, the Harvard Business Review, uh, Christine, Maslow, uh, Christine uh, Maslach has done a lot of work around it, um, and also the American Association of Critical Care Nurses. So they, they put out pillars that speak about, you know, skilled communication, true collaboration, authentic leadership, um, uh, adequate staffing, and so on. What I found though is the you know and if you if you look at at all of those they pretty much say the same thing that if you if you work on you know um, really closing the gaps on communication collaboration staffing that you can create a healthier work environment but I think the missing piece there is the disruptive behavior I mm. don't think anyone has come out to create to establish a pillar as such of of zero tolerance for disruptive behavior as essential for creating a psychological safety within the workplace where people can focus on job one. Yeah, I love that. Okay, now naturally, I got to ask you, define disruptive behavior for me. Is this, is this, is, is this you know, are, are chronic folks that come in like the narcissists or is this like just somebody having a bad day? How, where, where do we kind of draw the line with that? So I put them into two buckets or two categories, okay? Um, when I crisscrossed the country talking about this, especially with nurse executive leaders, I, I had the opportunity to go on a 10-city tour. And um, in speaking with nurse executive leaders from 10 different cities around the country, we decided that 85% of the staff, pretty much 85, maybe to 95, 90% of the staff, comes to work ready, willing, and able to do world-class care, do their job well, and work in a collegial manner, you know, where, you know, you're not going to be besties with everyone, but we're going to be able to get along so that we can focus on the work that needs to be done and essentially enjoy one third of our lives together. Um, then there is the other 15%. Of that 15%, we're going to call that 15% the disruptive behavior. And of that 15%, I believe there are two categories. Those folks that are chronically uncivil, and then those folks who are truly bullying. Now again, with this same group that um, I, I was speaking with, we further talked it up to decide that the larger proportion of uh, disruptive behavior, fortunately, is those folks that are chronically uncivil. And then the portion of people who truly engage in bullying all right, is about three to five percent of the staff. Wow, okay. But you're making a really important point. So while we're talking about a small percentage, the impact is extreme. Well, think about it. If you have, you know, um, so my background is healthcare. If you have, a, you know, a, a unit in or a department in healthcare, and you, you know, say you have 50, you know, um, staff members, all you need is one or two staff members um, to really either act in a chronically uncivil way or in a true bullying manner. And it can be extremely disruptive to people being able to focus on their job. And in healthcare, that could mean um, being distracted and missing something clinically, being distracted and creating a, maybe a medication error, uh, being so distracted that you are not really engaging with your patients the way you want to to create that wonderful patient experience, but that you're so distracted either by someone's chronic incivility or that you're being targeted by a bully that it's, it's almost impossible for you to do your job in a healthy way. Yeah, so, okay. All right, so now we got these two buckets. Our, 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 our um, bad players here. We've got our chronically uncivil and, um, and, and we've got our bullying. So let's talk about the chronically kind of uncivil. Um, what are some examples of that? What, paint that picture for us. Sure, so someone who's chronically uncivil, I really want to say that their, their main, you know, um, descriptive would be someone with low emotional intelligence. Someone who has very poor insight 
about how they are presenting themselves to the world. They have very little ability to self-manage, and they have almost no understanding of how their disruptive behavior affects the group. Um, they are just, they're not, they're not narcissistic in a way of it's all about me. They're just kind of like have no boundaries, no social boundaries, no understanding of this. So they, they pretty much stopped growth and development at that sophomoric high school kind of level. They're chronically late for work. They never get back from break on time. Um, they, you know, are, are always on their phone even at meetings. Um, they are, uh, their body language is inappropriate for the station that they're at in the department. Um, you know, uh, they, they have emotional outbursts, you know, where, you know, they slam things and do things that, again, are, you know, they have a low boiling point, so their self-management really needs to be worked on. And then it just creates, you know, the, 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 the way to understand that is this person is not actually looking to harm anybody. They're not looking to target anybody, abuse anybody, belittle or humiliate anyone. But what they, they, they don't understand, what the question you have in your head is, boy, it would be so much nicer to work here if I didn't have to put up with this one. So that, you know, the day you work with the person is far more arduous and distracting than the day that that person is off. And yeah. that kind of, you know, kind of says to you, if, I, if, it's, if it's easier to work in this environment without that chronically uncivil behavior, that's probably the person you have that's, a, you know, engaging in that type of disruptive behavior, which is the, the larger portion of the disruptive behavior overall category. So I'd be curious, in your experience, is it uh, possible to turn those folks around? Can, can, can they be coached? Can they be developed yeah. in a way to, maybe they'll never have the natural emotional intelligence, but, right. but can they learn processes and steps and things to minimize some of this unproductive behavior? So again, when we're talking about bullies and we're talking about chronically uncivil, I'm gonna speak about I'm going to answer your question in terms of the chronically uncivil. That's exactly right. We'll get, we'll get to our bullying friends here in just a minute. <laughs> okay. um, so the answer is yes. But the other piece is, is that there, there's, a, there's a couple of questions you need to ask yourself as a leader. The first question is, do, is this person's clinical performance, is this person's job performance worth the time and the effort to do this? Because mm. it's going to take a tremendous amount of investment of resources and people and time in order to turn this person around. And there's got to be some return on that investment. So if this person is a poor performer already, then the question becomes, do you, wanna, do you really want to invest in this? If this person, when they are acting adult-like, a really good performer and really adding value to your department, but really needs some grooming, um, and you want to invest some time and effort in them, the answer is yes. And the, they have the ability to self-reflect so that when you sit them down and say, listen, here's what I need for you to understand. The way you acted in that meeting is this, and here's the ripple effect from that. They're usually very shocked and uh, maybe even somewhat humbled by that kind of constructive feedback. If you offer them a pathway for self-improvement and ask them if they're going to make that kind of commitment, um, it may be a little unsettling, but they can do it. Now, the progress on that, com that commitment um, or on their commitment is, is almost like a staircase. You're going to go, you're going to get good at it and go up a step, and then they're going to make the same mistake and go down a step, and then maybe say, I can do this, and they're going to lean in harder to the training that you give them and the, the coaching, just-in-time coaching you give them. They go up two steps, and you can see maybe slow, but steady progress. And over time, you may say to yourself, well, that was certainly worth the effort, the time, and the resources to invest in that person. Yep. Yeah. Well, now, again, that I, I would base that decision on whether or not right now is this person, where is this, this person's performance level? Yeah. And is it worth that, are you going to get a return on the huge investment you're about to make on that staff member? Yeah, I think, I think that's such an important first question. And also, because if you do invest and keep them around and you're going to invest in this process, you know, it's not just you and them going on that journey. The rest of the staff is going on that journey with you. They get to experience that, the, the bumpiness along the way as well. And so it's, that's, that's you've, right. you've got to, I think you make a really important point. 
at the end of the day, is this going to be worth it? Keeping them, is, is it really going to be worth it to have everyone go through this uh, journey together? Right. And, you know, this is a case of there's a lot of water under the bridge. So when I say that this is a leadership imperative, really trying to create a healthy work environment that addresses the conventional pillars of a healthy work environment, but also disruptive behavior. What I'm really saying is, is that 85% who shows up every day, ready, willing, and able to do their very best, they're watching you as the leader, and they're wondering, what about this behavior do you not see, recognize, want to deal with? You know, are you condoning low performance? Are you condoning uncivil behavior? You know, uh, remember, those kinds of bad attitudes are contagious. So you could really damage the entire culture of your department yeah. by just letting this person arbitrarily run around like a chicken, you know, without a head. And then try to hold all of your top performers up to a different standard. It's not going to work. You're going to bleed talent doing it. Yeah, and so I think you're, you're already making some really important points for us because I know there's so many leaders listening right now that have probably turned, the, kind of looked the other way because these are subtle things, right? They're, 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 they're showing up late from, from, uh, to work or, or late for breaks or they're on their phone too much during meetings. It's not easily measurable things, but it's all those subtle things that are so contagious in a negative way that you're really highlighting for us that we, as leaders, we can't let that stand. It's going to cause issues. That's right. And, what, and, and part of that self-awareness piece and the, or the just-in-time coaching or the way you address this is, you know, of course, you're only going to focus on the behavior, but not just that person's behavior, but the consequence of that person's behavior for the team. So yeah. here, I am not picking on you because I don't particularly care for the way you do this or that. I am very concerned about the health of the work environment and your influence on the team, which right now is negative. And yeah. what are we going to do about that? Yeah. Well, I like that. What are we going to do about that? Putting the ownership on them, too. I like That's that. Correct. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about our other friends. Those bullying, yeah. those bullying friends. The, the, these folks, uh, their motives might be a little bit different than our, <laughs> than our uh, chronically uncivil. So Correct. So they... They're very, very different from chronically uncivil, although some, some, some characteristics may seem to commingle. So remember now, we're talking about 3 to 5% of your staff. So fortunately, this is the lowest proportion of disruptive behavior. And I say that because it's the most dangerous and it is the most destructive. Okay? So someone who is a bully really is targeting people in order to humiliate abuse, undermine confidence, uh, really, you know, uh, undermine that person's performance. And somehow it feeds their low self-esteem to try to destroy the self-esteem of another. Mm. So this is, this is a category to me that bullies are indeed narcissists. And if you're in healthcare, I usually you know, de describe them as narcissists with a license. Mm. So one of the things that I have taught myself over the years, when, I, when this finally kind of resonated with me, the difference between chronic incivility, low self-esteem, and a bully, narcissism. Now we have to take a look at the characteristics of this, of this personality disorder. So narcissism isn't psychosis. They're, they're quite grounded in reality but it is a true personality disorder. And if you look at that char the characteristics, you know, um, narcissists believe that everything revolves around them. You know, two, narcissists believe that they are highly special and you better think that they're special too. They demand privileges that they have not earned. Um, and there's a couple of things about the narcissist or the bully that we have to really raise our awareness of. Number one, is that they're usually highly skilled, highly intelligent. So when we talk mm. about academic preparation, they're usually spot on. When we talk about skilled at what they do, they're usually spot on. And this becomes their stock and trade of how they become important to your department even though they are terrorizing your state. So the, 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 the doubt question that they like to put into leaders is, could you really do without me? I mean, you rely on me so much. What would this department be if it wasn't for me 
backing you up or doing the orientation. I'm so knowledgeable and skilled. I add such value. And they want to use that to leverage you looking the other way for their disruptive bullying behavior and the fact that they're targeting staff. Oof. So, okay, These are, this, is a, this is a problematic bunch. Because so they answer, the, they, they do, we can't check off the box. Are they performers? The answer is yes. But they're, but they're, but they're leaving dead bodies in, in the wake. So there's a, there's a significant trade-off. Uh, so, un, so if we follow the same kind of idea that you had before where you know, we provide them feedback, we'd let them know the impact that they're having, are chronically uncivil, you said that might actually shock them. They would, they're, they're, they're kind of unaware of that. And they're typically willing to hear it. How about this bunch? If we call them out on their behavior, are they willing to hear it? And w w will they acknowledge it? Or are they going to try and spin that story? So interestingly enough, it's a couple of key characteristics to answering that question. Number one, I, I don't usually meet ugly narcissists. It's inconsistent with the term. And I don't usually meet ugly bullies. They're usually somewhat pleasant looking, good looking. They have winning smiles and maybe engaging eyes and they are charming mm. the piece that is to be wary of is that they have predator qualities mm. predator qualities okay. yeah predator qualities meaning that they use their magnetism their charm their you know relatively good looks their personality to win you over and then when you confront them with their disruptive behavior they will promise you the sun, the moon, and the stars. Mm. And they will look you right in the eye and say, I never had a leader invest in me like you. Oh my God, thank you. <laughs> and you will buy it. <clears throat> yeah. All right? And if you are in the healthcare business, unfortunately, we're very susceptible to buying that because we're professional caregivers. So as soon as that narcissist looks into our eyes and says, thank you for caring so much about me becoming the best person I can, it hits our caring trigger, and now we feel like we've done a good thing, and yeah. the narcissist bully is playing you like a fiddle, telling you exactly what you want to hear, hitting all the caregiver notes, and then will we'll probably show some remorse, although it being shallow. There'll be a period maybe of over-solicitation and helpfulness. Then there will be a period of uh, what I call irritability. Other people on the unit will probably sense this one's going to do something again soon, and sure enough, there's another bullying episode. So remember I said that the chronically uncivil improvement model would be going upstairs, yes. up, yep. maybe go yep. down, up yep. two, down one. Yep. The, the model for someone who is a narcissistic bully is a cycle, okay? And it's a similar cycle to the cycle we see in any type of abusive behavior whether it's child abuse, elder abuse, domestic violence, there is an episode followed by remorse, followed by over-solicitation, followed by a quiet period and then increasing irritability where the, everybody tries to placate, you know, do something to keep them happy, you know, and then all of a sudden, boom, another episode. They are unable to comply and sustain any promise to reform. Okay. Now, ask me why. <laughs> Tell us why. <laughs> because they don't believe there's a problem. Now, the, 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 the person who's chronically uncivil will self-identify yeah. and say, God, I'm real, I, I really have been acting like a fool, like a real idiot. I, I have to do better. But a narcissist really believes that they're fine and it's the rest of the world that needs to accommodate them. Therefore, there's no remediation of a yeah. bully narcissist. Yeah. There is only documentation and getting them to the door. Please don't fool yourself to think you can fix this person, work with this person, grow this person. Because someone who cannot identify that they are indeed having an issue has no motive to then remediate that issue themselves. Yeah. This is uh, giving me many, many flashbacks to my clinical training years ago, Phyllis, when uh, back then it was DSM-4 and it was Axis-2, yeah. which was all of our personality disorder friends and, yeah. and same type of, of using of, of um, emotions to manipulate. Yes. And everyone's just a, a tool that they can use, uh, particularly skilled with emotional manipulation. Well, 
what a what a wonderful point to make because really a narcissistic bully, right, or a bully, um, only makes relationships based on their usefulness, the value of their usefulness, which means that um, you know if you're my director and the usefulness right now is for me to get out of hot water and be able to stay employed, then I'm going to tell you what you want to hear. Okay, um, if I can also wind up a few sheep followers in the department and kind of incite them, which is why I call this shadow behavior. I, I live in the world of plausible deniability. So I can use other people that might have no insight into my manipulative predator qualities, wind them up and shove them out there, and all of a sudden they're trying to overthrow the government. They get thrown out. They get poor performance evaluations, and that person stands in the shadows. Yeah. Still. I remember back, way back my early days, you know, I was getting my clinical training and working on a unit. And then I, and every once in a while you get someone on the unit who's very skilled in this way, whether it's narcissism or other kind of personality disorder. And they would get one of the staff members to become their advocate. So we, right. we'd be back, you know, when we'd be doing all of our, our, our um, filling out all of our reporting for that shift. And that staff member would say, you know, I think you've got Joe all wrong. You really do. I mean, yeah. he's, he's right. really a good guy. I think we should really do more things for Joe. <laughs> so and we would say, wow, that. Joe, Joe got gotcha. you. Joe, yeah. Joe got gotcha. you. You and I both know that we call that gaslighting, right? Right. So, so there's, there's a couple of fundamental things in, in uh, bullying behavior. Number one, they're going to tell you what you want to hear with absolutely no ability to be able to sustain their promises. Okay? Um, number two, they're going to gaslight. All right, so they always are going to live in the world of plausible deniability. I, that's not what I said. That person misunderstood. Oh, I'm really sorry. I can't believe they, you know, I only said this. This was my intent. And, you know, this goes on and on and on. And it's the same plausible deniability no matter what. And then if you're really not sure if you're dealing with a bully narcissist, then uh, I'm going to say, what about their leapfrogging behavior? So remember, a narcissist thinks that they are so very special. So they should only be talking to people who are equally special. So one of the key things that I have found is that they leapfrog middle management and go directly to the top of the person mm. they feel is more powerful. Because after all, you're just a middle manager. And even though that's my chain of command, you're just a middle manager. And I am far more important. And I need to speak to people who are equally special and important. Therefore, I leapfrog middle management and go right to a director, even administration. Wow. Okay. So uh, I want to kind of land our plane a little bit in this. So if we do um, think we've got one of these folks on our team, okay, what are some other signs and what are some ways for us to shine the light? E e whether, the, whether that's, you know, exit them or figure out exactly what's going on. What are, what are some steps we can take as managers? So the big cautionary step here for anyone in any organization, in any working venue, okay, is that you never take on a bully alone. They are too conniving and too controlling and very, very slick at gaslighting. They will turn this, the table on you or turn the situation around to make you look like the one who's harassing them. And it could be very detrimental to your career. So what you need to do is start your anecdotal notes and, you know, dates and times and who and what, when, and why. And make sure that you build a case in your notes of this person who has this cyclical behavior, regardless of your just-in-time coaching, maybe you sent them to some training, whatever the case may be. It's not one person complaining that they're being targeted, but it's a variety of people, or you witness it, you finally witness it yourself. And then you have to go to administration and human resources, so that it has to be the manager or the leader of the department with executive administration and human resources having a coordinated action plan in order to address this. Because as soon as this narcissist bully smells smoke, like there's a little heat, they're going to leapfrog you, go right to the director of human resources and gaslight and do everything to create the impression that they are being harassed. If you don't go and explain this situation to executive administration and human resources first, you could find yourself in very deep, hot water. You have to be able to give them the heads up of, and this is how this person has, has conducted themselves in the past. I fully expect when I do this action plan or this performance evaluation or this write-up with this person, 
that they are going to come directly to you to complain about me and try to say that they are the victim and I am the bully. And once you have that coordinated buy-in, then you can proceed. Beautiful point. I've seen, I have a client right now who unfortunately did not do that properly. And when she was putting heat on this younger new employee that she had, the person immediately went up to um, the legal counsel and said, uh, I'm being um, harassed and discriminated against, which then started an investigation. Uh, right. And then and the one, and investigation didn't find anything. But then now my client feels like she can't move on this employee because of that history. And you, you see how slick a narcissist is. They, they, knew full, they know full well. So again, plausible deniability, plausible deniability. And human resources is not really going to make a, any kind of an effort or a move unless they are sure that they have all four corners of that story nailed yeah. down because they don't want to invite wrongful termination suits or anything else. So, Phil, before we kind of officially close this conversation, it sounds like um, once you've kind of gone through this path, you want to try and exit this person as quickly as you can. It doesn't sound like giving them another chance is going to yield the kind of fruits that we would hope for. No, so that's correct. You know, when this person starts showing them their col your, you know, the colors, uh, don't repaint them. Understand what you have, you know, and it could be a little unsettling. It could be a little nerve-wracking in the beginning. But, you know, watch the cyclical behavior. Watch the, you know, are they leapfrogging? If, is there always something to do with plausible deniability? Is it always the other person? Remember, a narcissist cannot, cannot accept accountability for their behavior. It always is somebody outside of them that is wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Uh, Phil, this was a fantastic conversation. So um, I always ask all my guests this question. Is, is, uh, do you have one life hack for us on how we can either have healthier conversations or better relationships at work or, or, or at home, frankly? So I, I think really all of us need to work on our emotional development um, or our emotional intelligence. I think and I, I put out there that emotional intelligence is the pathway for building resilience. And I saw so much of this during the pandemic that you know folks who who had a fairly strong sense of emotional intelligence fared a little bit better um, and were able to to circle back to the bigger picture um, you know why why is this happening uh, was one question for sure but the other question would be that they found purpose and meaning in what they were doing and the only way to stay connected to purpose and meaning is to really have a good understanding of yourself who you are and, and what's your place in the world. And that's exactly what emotional intelligence is. That's beautiful. Thank you. So if people want to learn more about you, buy a copy of your book, uh, where can they go? So there's two ways you can do it. You can, and I, I welcome everybody to come and visit my, my website, which is MFW Consultants, Michael Frank William, MFWConsultants.com. To purchase the book, you'd go to the store tab and just click on the store tab and you can see the book there and you can be able to order a hard copy of the book. If you prefer a Kindle version, then you can put my name in um, to Amazon and the Kindle version will pop up. Excellent. Fantastic. Phil, this is an absolute pleasure. Um, it, it, not only was this very practical tips for dealing with some of the real challenges in our workplace, um, but it sent me down memory lane. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Really, really enjoyed the conversation um, and continue to keep up this great fight against uh, workplace unhealthiness. Uh, I, I and we really appreciate it. So I'm just going to say, hopefully everybody goes and does some spring cleaning in their department. I think you. that's great. All right, as usual, I got myself pages of notes here and I, Phyllis did not disappoint. She really, really delivered on her promise. And what I loved was how specific she was. So I wanna go into, um, you know, we talk about healthy work environments, but she really frames it up as the absence of these disruptive behaviors. And she honed in on disruptive behaviors. And she said, listen, 85% of your staff come into work, they're ready to work, they're healthy and they wanna get stuff done. It's the 15% that are disruptive. Uh, of that 15%, the bulk are the folks that are chronically uncivil. And, and, and then the other smaller percentage are the really nasties. And that's going to be our narcissistic bullying behavior. So let's talk about the chronically uncivil. She said, these are the folks that just have low EQ. They just, they come in, they come in late. They're on their phone in meetings. They are kind of rude. 
Um, they just, they, they have their postures off, everything just, they just don't seem to really get it or really care. Um, she said they actually can be coachable, so you can pull them aside, let them know how their behavior is affecting the team and then help kind of coach them. Now she said the first step is you have to ask yourself, is their performance good enough for me to invest this effort? Because this is gonna be a journey. They're gonna take um, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back. And that's gonna be disruptive for the staff around them as they're, as they're growing. But they can learn and it's gonna require effort and coaching on our part. But we've gotta ask ourselves, is it worth the investment? The second group she said, was our bullying. She said, these people, they target people to humiliate, abuse, undermine, so they can overcome their own degree of, of low self-esteem. She said, the problem with these folks is they're highly skilled. So we know they're performing and they know they're performing. They're typically very charming. They may be handsome or attractive um, and, and they know how to kind of get their way. She said, going a little bit further with these folks, their behavior, um, if we coach them, if we try and give them feedback, they're gonna use, turn on their charm and tell us, oh yeah, thank you so much for investing in me, but they're gonna cycle. They're never gonna be two steps forward, one step back. It's just gonna be a cycle. So they're gonna kinda pretend like they're making progress, but it's all gonna come back around again. I, I asked her, I said, how can you tell that we were dealing with a bully? Because these are the nasties. These, these, these people are really troublesome. She said, they're gonna leapfrog middle management. So they're gonna, if you're their boss, they're gonna skip over you and try and spend a lot of time talking with more powerful people. Um, they're gonna do a lot of gaslighting, plausible deniability, never take full responsibility for their behaviors. They're gonna always kind of be behind the scenes doing a lot of manipulation. So then the final question I asked her was, how do we deal with these folks? She said, first thing is never take on a bully alone. They will beat you because we're playing their game. Um, and so she said, first thing is make sure you're documenting, documenting, documenting. When you have enough and make sure you're noting the cycle behavior, things you've observed, any coaching and feedback you've given them, then you go to HR and administration. You make sure everybody kind of knows. You go as high as you can about this behavior because as soon as they smell smoke, they're going to go as high as they can and say, you are bullying them. You are harassing them. You are discriminating against them. And before you know it, and I've seen it many, many times, an investigation will be started about you. Not about them, about you. And by the time the investigation ends, they typically take three to six months, nothing would have been found, but your hands are gonna be tied and you're not gonna be able to act on this person. And they're gonna get to hang out even longer. So you wanna make sure you move up the chain first and then you wanna have a unified approach to them and don't try and coach them, you really just need to exit them. So uh, I thought all those were tips were really, really helpful for us. So uh, I hope those will arm you as you're dealing with some of the more challenging personalities that can really disrupt our workplace because gosh, folks, work is hard enough. It shouldn't be any harder. Uh, and so these are all ways for us to make our workplaces healthier and help equip the rest of our staff with the um, emotional environment that they need to be successful. Now's the portion of our show where we get to look at our listener fan mail. I want to thank you all who have written us a review, who put in the stars and written their comments. It really means a lot and helps us get better at what we do. So here's what I got to share today from Wolfram, who writes, relevant, engaging, and practical. This is one of the few podcasts I listen to consistently. Brandon delivers valuable content for anyone wishing to level up in their career, regardless of industry, function, or role. If you're new to the show, definitely take the time to work your way through the archive. Thanks so much for leaving that review. And if you want to leave a review, you can go to Apple, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcast and take a few minutes to just leave us some words. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.